that would be very beneficial um, for the next part of the meeting. And then after the breakout sessions, we'll come back together as a whole group where the reporters will then share some of those highlights that your group had discussed. And we'll kind of go over that together. Um, does anybody have any questions? And I will put the questions in the chat too once we go into breakouts. On that note, I think we might be ready, Sable. Just give everybody a minute to come back. And I'm sharing my screen. So I'm going to make my best guess as to when everybody's here. So um, we hope you all had a good opportunity to connect in small groups. And now we want to reflect on that opportunity in a large group debrief. And so Christina, in the um, instructions that she gave before we went into small groups, asked you to have a recorder and a reporter. And so your recorder, the recorders, whoever you are, you're going to follow these instructions and go to menti.com, enter this code, and you're going to um, just take a few minutes to share um, highlights from each of the questions that you were asked. And then um, once we give them a minute to do that, we will share the responses. And then your reporter, so the reporter for each group, is then going to share uh highlight or in a challenge of, of what was shared out in the response. So we're just going to make sure that we each have a chance for the group to share out. And we have about 20 minutes to do this. So go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to make sure if we have any questions that they're being answered. No, nope. Okay. And then we've got the information in the um, chat as well. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And then that way, Christina can pull up the Menti, and we can see responses populating. And just as we're waiting for that, you know, we use every single bit of information you give us to um, iterate on how we provide our TA and our coaching, how we're advocating at the policy level. So we really appreciate what you're sharing with us and it's very useful. And we know it's useful to your peers too. They learn so much from you. So we got a first response, which is great. And we'll just let a few more roll in. How many small groups did we have, Christina or Sable? I believe we had six, Sable. Um, um five so we were missing some people okay so we had five okay so we have four more responses that we're waiting on to trickle in and then that means that we'll have four report outs as well second here thank you so much And we're gonna um, save, once this is finalized, we're going to uh, save this as a PDF and we'll make sure we send it out to you all so you have this information. Um, and then you all have your grantee rosters too. So we always encourage you to reach out to one another if you learned something today um, and wanna have follow-up. So I think we just have two more responses that we're waiting on. And I guess we could get started with a debrief from the um, report out. So um, I don't care who goes first and I don't know who wrote what because Menti is anonymous like that. So 
whoever um, shared, if you'd like to report out, we're ready to get started with that. So this is Wanda. Our group, um, there are three individuals or three group members that have the design grant, and then there's two group members that have the scale-up grant. We talked about reach out. Um, employers are contacted through things like the chamber, and we also talked about high school CTE programs and college um, programs being contacted. Emails are being sent to child current child care providers, and then information sessions, lunch and learn, and we are, one of the group members said she is partnering with a community navigator. And then um, we're building on existing relationships. So that information is being shared through community partners and stuff. Thank you so much, Wanda. Can I ask Listen, a, just a quick clarifying question? I know. Um, you said emails are being sent to child care providers. Are you getting the email list from your local resource centers? That's where I got mine, was I okay. had to fill out a list and then I was able to get, not all child care providers have email addresses, um, right. but a large portion of child care providers did. Good, okay. I just wanted to verify that you're, you're utilizing the resource centers, that's great. Yep. Great question, Alan. All right, who's next? Who would like to share? I'm happy to share. Um, so we, we talked about a few different things, um, really wanting to make sure that uh, there are um, incentives. So one of our groups um, in the UP is doing a one-time incentive of up to um, $1,500 to help offset the cost of developing training. Um, and that can include, so that's like to the RTI provider, which is really interesting. Um, so it can help offset costs of developing the trainings in the first place. Um, we also talked about um, uh, incent the incentive structure for um, mentors um, to be part of it. There are different um, ideas about how to handle that because you can either um, directly pay the mentors or like pay the program. And so we were talking about what worked well for um, different programs. Um, and then we also talked a lot about the importance of serving um, um, what's the word, serving as the intermediary um, as a benefit because it really helps childcare providers to navigate that process, navigate all the paperwork. Um, and so that was something that we were able to do. And then the other the other sort of big benefit um, that we at Childcare Network are able to do that we talked about um, was being able to kind of stay closely relate, say um, like and closely monitor the work of the apprentice and the mentor because they are, we are the um, training of the RTI for that. Um, and so being able to always be checking in with the apprentice and mentor um, sort of on a weekly and then also a monthly basis is really helpful. Thank you, Sebastian. And I think I was gonna say, I want to make sure that you all know that you have, we will have time for q and A. I think we're gonna get through each of the updates. And if we have time at the end, then if anybody has questions for any of the reporters or any of the things that we've shared, you know, we can ask at that time. April, do you wanna share next? Uh, yes, um, our group, we um, we have of course our, the expansion and then we have two that are startup in our program. So we just basically kind of, um, talked about um, like from our program stances that we are, um, we do a lot of emailing out because we are RC. So we're emailing out to our different childcare providers, um, working with them on developing how um, you could be part of the registration, pro uh, registration registered um, programming. We also uh, shared with them that we have some of our, um, we now have a, grants through WDI and my RAPs to be able to incentivize them to come a, become a part of this. We also pay for their training because we are an RTI, so we do the training. So we're able to pay for those who want to be a part of the uh, child care, the CDA and um, their apprenticeship. So basically it was more me sharing out. And then there, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, how they're building out from there, um, developing their programming. So that's a quick, quick, can Thank you, April. 
Do we have another, Pam? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in our group, we had uh, one design and two scale up. And we all have been doing outreach uh, in a variety of methods, in person, via email, et cetera, having conversations about the benefits of registered apprenticeship, how it uh, impacts um, your talent pipeline, how it impacts employers, the workforce system as a whole. Um, and typically once, uh, the, the descriptor of apprenticeship and the benefits have been, um, highlighted, there's really not a lot of selling to employers. They're usually ready to jump on board. Um, part of it is because of their need, but then, um, the other part I think is that there are some financial incentives to that employer uh, it help, uh, helps to alleviate some of that budget stress um, through uh, supporting the RTI and some of the uh, support services that are being offered. Um, secondly, uh, the other question, oh, we aren't on that yet. Never mind. I'm jumping ahead. Okay, and we have one more. Dick, is that you or you want to share out? Or do you have a question? Oh, yeah, so um, in our group, uh, three of the folks are all from the east side, thumb area, south. Um, they're all in the design phase, uh, grantee. Um, different places and connecting with employer partners. Thought a couple things. One for recruiting. Um, Heidi is very involved with different advisory committees, um, both at the, I think, at the community college and some other other gatherings of folks. Um, I heard somebody said the Chamber of Commerce as well. And then um, it was, oh my gosh, Karen, who mentioned this WIA or WE WIN Workforce Intelligence Network that they have an incentive that they have available through a Apprenticeship Building America grant, they pay, give employers $3,500. If I misspoke, um, Karen, you can correct me, but that's what I heard. So there's some dollars involved um, and still just kind of building that network with employers. Yep. Great information. All right. Do we want to go to the next question, Christina? Great. And as we're waiting for these responses to populate, um, just doing a time check and we have our guest presenter, Kelsey, here. So we'll probably have far less time to do a report out. But I think what we'll do is we'll have um, the responses populate and then um, we might have time for like one or two questions. Um, but like I said, we'll send this mentee PDF out to you so you have it and um, you know how to get in touch with one another. So hopefully we're not having IT issues and we, <laughs> yay, thank you, whoever did it. All right, and we got a second one, a third. Wonderful, great information. All right, and I wanna make sure there's time for any questions. So before we've got, um, just about six minutes. So if we want to ask any questions, um, of anything that came up, now would be a great time to do that.
All right, if we have no questions, is there anybody um, that just shared who would like to report out on what they share? Terry's asking, what is work hands? So work hands is, um, it's called Rafter. That's what the state is calling it. But it's uh, an, an app that apprentices download on their phone and then they get to see where they are in their program as well as the employer is able to utilize that to track the apprentices hours and to approve the hours. One, I know, I know RAPS has been, and WorkHands has been mentioned before. I'm trying to remember. Is, is, is it a free app? It is a free app because the state, um, they ended up paying money. So that all we can utilize that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. All right. Well, I'll put it out there one more time. If anybody wants to ask a question or wants to share out on what they shared, now's the time to do it. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Alan to introduce our guest. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, very quick introduction. Um, I, it, I'm very happy to introduce Kelsey Laird, who is the Director of Professional Programs for uh, the Michigan Association for the Education of Young Children. Um, Kelsey has met previously with a scale-up grantees, and today she's going to be sharing more information with us on the TEACH scholarship program, um, which um, many apprenticeships would be able to participate in. Many apprentices should, should be able to participate in. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you all for letting me have a little bit of time of your meeting today. It's wonderful to be here. Some some familiar faces, some new faces. Um, I am the uh, overseeing the Teach Scholarship Program for Michigan AEYC, in addition to a whole lot of other workforce supports that our organization provides for ECE employers and uh, caregivers here in Michigan. So I wanna spend a little bit of time going over TEACH, some of those new supports that we're offering, especially new for this year, and um, then just open it up too for some Q&A or maybe some general discussion about how you might see some of these supports fitting in with your apprenticeship programs. Let's see if I can, there we go. So we're not gonna get real deep into the weeds of the actual TEACH scholarship model because uh, those of you that, that have worked with TEACH uh, with employers or recipients in the past know that it is uh, really dependent on the needs of the particular employer and their staff on what the model will, will provide for them. So we have um, completely stipend-based scholarships for some providers to earn a credential or a degree in early childhood ed, like their CDA or their Michigan Youth Development Associate credential, associate's bachelor's or master's in early childhood ed. Um, and then some of them are a collaborative effort between employers, the actual uh, student, so our we call them our teach recipient, and uh, our funder, who is uh, formerly the Michigan Department of Ed, who are now under my leap uh, in the Office of Great Start, to get all of that wrapped around my, my head as we move into the, the new department. Uh, the TEACH model really emphasizes a lot of things that your apprenticeship models do. So you'll see a lot of the same um, goals you know, increasing of our of wages of participants, reduction and turnover in the early childhood programs, um, sustainable staffing for employers, and then increasing the education of those working directly in the field as they are on the job. So while there is sort of a lot of overlap in some of our goals, uh, I think there are a lot of ways that we can partner to bring our TEACH supports and Michigan AEYC supports and stack them with 
all of the workforce um, development dollars and the supports that the apprenticeship model already brings to those students. Uh, the financial supports are really straightforward. Um, tuition paid if needed. We work with students that are currently on Michigan Reconnect, and so they don't all need necessarily that full tuition payment, but TEACH can provide wraparound support in out-of-district tuition, in course fees uh, that might not be covered in any other circumstance or scholarship uh, funding. And it also allows students to maximize their Pell benefit uh, to receive that to support them in all the other expenses that can be incurred while somebody needs to be attending school. So the tuition payment is straightforward. It's either 80% or it's a flat fee stipend based on what model their employer works out for them. And then the student access stipends, bonuses, uh, we put quality stipends on every TEACH account that is participating in um, Great Start to Quality and provide paid release time. So if they need to study, if they need to um, adjust their work schedule so that they can attend class, um, sometimes it's, well, I have to go grocery shopping because I can't do that while I'm attending night class and working all day. So that paid release time offers them a little bit of flexibility to be able to um, still be paid their regular hourly wage. And then we actually just reimburse the employer for that paid time off for those students. Um, the TEACH model also helps cover the cost of credentialing fees. So we can cover the CDA assessment fee and my YDA assessment fee as well. Additionally, besides the financial piece though, what they do receive is a whole lot of wraparound support and uh, somebody that's that's with them from start through, I won't say finish because we are with our students beyond the completion of their credential and degree and moving into just main, maintenance of their professional development training requirements. So all of our TEACH scholarships recipients receive, as well as our employers, have a dedicated program specialist. Um, and those uh, specialists will assist them, the recipients in navigating college admission processes, student orientations, registration, um, figuring out articulation agreements. So if I start school at this community college, uh, what's the best pathway for me if eventually maybe I'm going to consider getting a four-year degree? Uh, so we our program specialists have really in-depth information and knowledge about all of the credential and degree programs throughout the state and how those articulations work together to really coach the students through a pathway that's going to benefit them. They don't have duplication in coursework, um, and it's really uh, out of respect for their, their time and, and their financial um, needs as they're progressing through the career pathway. We do provide um, additional training for our credential candidates. So we, we do boot camp days, basically. We have CDA resource days and my YDA resource days. And we also have just started offering those for our high school CTE instructors to really become um, knowledgeable about what the credentialing process looks like from start to finish. So outside of the training requirements, we're coaching candidates through how to fill out the online application, how to complete their professional portfolio down to like what goes in what section of each of those pages of their portfolio. We do a mock verification visit with our credential candidates so they actually experience what it's going to be like when a CDA PD specialist will come in and do their verification visit for their credentialing. And we provide a mock CDA exam for them as well. So they feel really confident and they their employers understand too what it's what is it going to be like when that verifier comes into my program. Um, so there aren't any surprises. It makes it much more comfortable for them to actually complete the process once they've finished their training. Outside of just the teach support, we also have um, coaching and consultative support for, and this is one of those new pieces for fiscal 24 for our statewide directors, as well as new staff. So new staff onboarding support uh, will be fulfilled by one of our program coordinator, two of our program coordinators who are providing in-person and virtual coaching, consultation, training, resources, everything that they need from 
um, could be pre-service through their first several months of being on the job. Um, and that really, you know, in support of what the apprenticeship model looks like is that we are wanting them to be um, confident, trained, feeling like they are uh, going to be successful when they are in the classroom um, and not uh, walk out the door a week later, basically, because they may be overwhelmed or feeling un under-resourced or un under-educated in what they need to be successful from day one. So some of those pieces will be um, initial training on developmentally appropriate practices or uh, successful classroom environments, social emotional learning, um, challenging behaviors. So diving right into the, what do I need from day one to manage a classroom? And at the same time, providing them with the career navigation piece of, okay, so we're, you know, your day one gonna be successful. You're not gonna, you're not on your own. And here, welcome to the profession. Here are all of the opportunities that we can help guide you to start that education process, um, whether it's starting the credentialing process, the training, um, getting into a degree program. For our directors, we are um, working with regional director groups as well and, and bringing them together statewide as well as independently in regions to address their specific training needs and provide exactly this, uh, what's happening in apprenticeships, what can we, what what resources and supports do you have for recruit and retention? Um, we're working on a careers and early childhood directory and a workforce support toolkit that we, um, in coordination with ECIC, want to be handing to our directors statewide and our program administrators statewide to say, hey, we know hiring is hard. You're facing a recruitment and retention issue. Here are some tools that can help you with that, including apprenticeship. And here's how we're going to get you started um, on all of these pieces together and then coaching them through that process so they're not on their own. So that's where all of our partnerships will come into play, where we really want to be connecting with you when we are having those on the ground conversations with directors who might uh, be interested in, in the apprenticeship model and, and connecting you um, on the ground. The I said I wasn't going to get nitty gritty with teach, but I did want to provide just a little bit of, um, you know, what does it, if a teach recipient uh, is participating in teach, in addition to what they're receiving uh, as support financially and mentoring and on the job training from their apprenticeship, um, these are specific pieces that teach will provide for them. Um, basically, statewide, our average community college. Uh, tuition for either CDA training, my YDA training, or the associate's degree will allow that student to have about $150 cash, cash back, essentially, uh, each semester that they are on a TEACH scholarship. So that's after we've already paid the tuition up front for the school, and then they're getting that money back. Each semester after we award all of those stipends, that can go up based on their quality um, participation as well. Their book reimbursements, um, a bonus each year from our program after they've completed at least nine credit hours, a raise or a bonus from their employer each year after completing those nine, at least nine credit hours. They have access to our professional uh, program specialists, career navigators, providing resources and support, um, moving them beyond where they currently are and whatever credential pathway and seeing you know what are the other opportunities that might be ahead in the ECE career pathway and then that access to their statewide network of ECE student peers through both our Michigan AUIC membership, through the TEACH scholarship, um, all of our student uh, alumni, uh, as well as just our general ECE population statewide. Their employers can get that uh, release time each semester. They're getting a quality bonus as well if they are moving beyond health and safety and the GSQ quality improvement process. Um, they most importantly have a commitment from their sponsored employee to remain with their program after completing their scholarship. And then they also, as directors and administrators, have access to that coaching and consultation for recruitment retention practices and their uh, network of statewide ECE peers. 
That was a lot of information in like 10 minutes, I know. So I definitely want to, I'm actually gonna stop the screen sharing so I can open it up for, maybe I'm gonna stop, there we go. Open it up for what questions you might have or additional clarifications on any of the new initiatives or existing teach work. And you haven't seen the end of me, just FYI. I plan to come crash some more of your meetings. So if you don't think of any questions between, you know, the now and the end of the meeting, feel free to email me um, or ask me next time we're together. Kelsey, um, I know some of this is repeat information for some people and new information for others. So, um, you know, trying to find a median, how to like share the information. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate how you did that. And um, I know one thing that is coming up um, in my work and with apprenticeship, but also um, with the grantees is administrators really saying like, yeah, our workforce needs support, but like we need support too. Like we're part of the workforce. And so I really love that there's that component of administrator support. And it's not something I've ever personally, like being in the field for so long, ever tapped into or really knew much about. Do you, um, like, have you found that that's a service or a feature that's being utilized as much as it should? And do you find that, like, different providers interact with it in different ways? Like, maybe your large Head Start versus your smaller center versus your home provider? And do you have any tips for, um, you know, the grantees for kind of differentiating how they pitch, teach to those different providers? I wish that I did, but we are like, we are launching it right now. We just upscaled and hired for our program coordinator position. So while we have always had um, employer support through the teach model, because our program specialists provide that for our teach employers, uh, we haven't had large scale statewide, regardless of teach participation or not, administrator support at that level where it's direct um, consultation, TA and training. And our model will be both a, a statewide and a local, very, very local approach where uh, the goal is a statewide sustainable system where we can provide uh, administrator level support for recruitment and retention. And sometimes it's just, hey, my staff really need a training on challenging behaviors or, hey, we're having this problem how, you know, I have a business practice issue. So it could be, you know, something that we're seeing as a workforce trend and pattern that administrators will need access to training statewide. And it could be just an independent issue that we're here to provide that consultative um, experience with. Yeah, that's really, really exciting. And uh, support like that, like, makes it feel easier to be an administrator, I think. So I think, that's a selling point too, when you're pitching these ideas to the employers is like, hey, there's this new thing, you know, and like, you can be one of the first to try it out. And hey, I know you're said this is really hard. Like, this is a great resource and it's going to be statewide. So I just thanks so much, Kelsey. Are there any other questions or Alan, do you have any other thoughts that you want to add? Um, I have a question that I was going to does anybody else have a question for Kelsey? Uh, yeah, I have a question around, yep. uh, you know, knowing that uh, with with teach, there's also that wage increase, just like we have built into apprenticeship model. And uh, the sustainability of wage increases is, is you know, first and foremost on a, a lot of their their minds as they've dealt with short term grants and short term programs that might increase the wages for a little bit. But then they go away and the wages are are back where they were. Um so especially as we see, um, uh, hopefully see an inflation decrease, and uh, then there might be, might st there's still going to be this issue though about the sustainability of wages. So is there any, any I wouldn't say solution to that, but are you seeing that same either resistance to the program because of the wage increase uh, and or is it being framed a different way, like in total compensation package? Uh, in, have you found a, a place in the state where it's being done well and framed well? Yeah, good question. 
our wage increase, what we find in program, mostly larger programs that are challenged with that sustainability of uh, wage increases for a large population of their staff or potentially, you know, out of step with what their um, scale might be for employees is that bonus option. Uh, so it can be framed as just a one-time bonus instead of an ongoing increase in wages. So that's definitely an option we see a lot of employers moving to, especially as their employees are sort of maxing out and these wage levels that we're seeing higher and higher. Um, I don't know necessarily that I could say give, you know, any one program would be better off in one you know, one direction or the other, but that's why we do offer that as an option either way. I don't know if I actually answered your question. So if I didn't, please feel free to let me know and I'll try to re-clarify. No, I don't think there is an answer right now. Yeah. Um, I think we're getting there, but I think it's something right as part of, you know, uh, at the new department of my leap. And, you know, that's something that's been a, a big topic of conversation among our providers and really any any involved is the wages not just for if we look you know at 4k for all and then we have higher wages at that level well when we might still see the the lower wages at anything before and then the the turnover when those positions open up for a higher paying position yeah, yeah. I, I think it's very consistent across the board of the trend moving out of community based uh child care programs into higher paying um, GSRP or Head Start positions that we definitely, that's a trend we see in teach data as well. We have been also over the last year seen a significant increase in the number of applications. We, we have a wage eligibility right now of 1960 per hour. We are one of the very few teach states left that is holding on to a wage eligibility um, once the <laughs> Uh, sustainability grants or stabilization grants, excuse me, hit other states, they removed their wage eligibility because basically everybody was over income. Michigan isn't seeing that. I would, of course, we're not seeing the applications that don't come in, but the data that we do have is showing an increase, but it's only at, you know, like 1% of our applications are denied doing, due to being over income. I think I think these issues speak to um, the need for multifaceted solutions to uh, workforce development and and especially around wage scale for the early childhood community. Uh, I don't think it's a one one solution fits all. Um, there's definitely a need for greater investment overall um, and. Uh, but it also, to Kelsey's point, it speaks to the need to be able to sustain a mixed delivery system and that it cannot all be investment in school-based programs because um, while that helps to some degree, you know, families with four-year-olds, it's not a solution for every family. And it also doesn't help having a system that supports the provision of infant toddler care care for younger, you know, children younger than four. So Kelsey, the, the question I had, uh, which I, I, I think I know the answer to, but it might be helpful for folks to hear is, um, especially in terms of communication to employers, as, as you're, they're talking about the advantages of apprenticeships and employers who may be already either participating or aware of TEACH, um, just the concepts of the these, the programs can be layered in terms of the benefits. Um, could you talk about that maybe a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. I, there's benefit to stacking. You know, we we want to maximize all of the resources that the employers and their staff have available to them. So we already are stacking with all of, you know, Michigan Reconnect with Pell Dollars, with our Michigan Tuition grant, all of these things that we want students to be able to take a benefit or take advantage of. And so I, I think it really would, it, 
we need to examine what each individual is receiving from their apprenticeship support and what they what additionally they could receive from teach um, what the benefit is of maybe stacking the tuition dollars from workforce development dollars and utilizing our CCDBG funding. We know, um, you know, grading the funding for these students is going to be much more sustainable long term, regardless of where the funding is coming from. Um, and then just those wraparound supports, too, that you really can't put a financial number on, but really are important to that retention piece for the workforce and them feeling supported um, during their learning time, during their apprenticeship, and then beyond. And where are they, you know, we we want to retain them in the workforce once they're getting their um, apprenticeship, once they've completed their, their apprenticeship and gotten their credentials. So what's the next step for them? Um, that's where we really see Michigan AEYC continuing that relationship and um, helping them navigate the career pathway. Great, thank you. All right, well, thank you all. Thank you, Kelsey, so much for joining us. We really appreciate that. having me. It was nice to see everybody. Yeah, we'll we're soon. Yeah, we'll see you soon. All right, so we're gonna move um, into the next part of our agenda. Um, but that question, Darren, that you had asked about sustainability and like the narrative around it, you know, one of the things, um, somebody said something to me this week that isn't new information, but it was like, oh yeah, absolutely. And I think the thing about the childcare workforce is that it's not for the sake of having the childcare workforce, just for the sake of having a childcare workforce. All other workforces depend on this workforce. So when we think about the power that we have to advocate for sustainability and funding streams and what we all know individually that maybe we don't know collectively, like we have to think about it like that. It's not just this is a workforce that we're trying to support. It's like this workforce supports all other workforces. And it really needs to be um, supported financially in that way and seen as a critical component. So that was just one of my ideas that I had bubbling up from that. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and share our last slide and then Christina is going to move us into close. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nicole. So just looking here for closing, um, all of the highlights that were shared during our little mentee session from the breakout rooms, um, all of the, those highlights will be shared within a PDF in the follow-up email to come. Um, I do want to point out that the Early Childhood Investment Corporation will be closed all of next week. Uh, so we will be gone from December 25th through January 1st and will return to regular business operations beginning on January 2nd. Um, another quick update in regards to um, for design grantees and all grantees in general. Um, I just want to let you know I will actually be on vacation until January 16th. Um, I will return that day. So we just kindly ask as a friendly reminder to send any type of questions, comments, concerns our way. Um, by utilizing the technical assistance at ecic4kids.org email. And I will put that reminder out in the follow-up as well. Um, in just a minute here, I'm going to share our post uh, learning community survey. If you could just take a couple of minutes to fill that, out, fill that out at your convenience, just for any feedback pertaining to today's session. We greatly appreciate it. And then Last but not least, I just want to bring awareness to spending reports. Our next one is due January 31st, 2024. I know many of us have mentioned this during our bi-monthly progress meetings, um, but just bringing awareness that we'll be looking at these ones um, a little bit more in detail just to see how everyone's doing as far as on track throughout their project. But if you run into any issues or need support with these, please, again, feel free to reach out to that technical assistance email, and we'd be more than happy to set up a time to meet with you or discuss how we can best be supportive. Um, other than that, yeah, thank you so much. Um, we just want to thank you all for coming today, and some of us will still be seeing you uh, later this week. But thank you so much, and we hope you all have a wonderful holiday season, and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.